Good morning, friends, and welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Thank you so much for joining me. We're starting a brand new chapter in 1 Corinthians. Come and join me as we're going to get deep in the water this week as we wake up in the Word. Listen, we've got a, a passage today that somebody actually told me, a friend in ministry, he said, you're not really going to go through 1 Corinthians, are you? He said, don't you realize that there are several places in there, especially chapter 12, where you're going to make some people mad. Some people just be upset with you. There's no way out of it. It's too controversial. I said, really? We've got to do it. we got to plod through the Word of God, even the tough parts. And hey, listen, don't get mad at somebody because they don't line up with your particular interpretation of a passage of Scripture, but we'll deal with some of these in a way that I think is the correct interpretation, and we'll let the chips fall where they may. Now, yesterday, we had a great day in worship at First Baptist. We elected five new deacons to serve our congregation. We uh, had a gigantic personnel committee report with all the new volunteers, ministry teams, and other things that are going on, and still in need of hands and help right here in Winsboro to keep the ministry going. But at the heart of all of that are two things that are kind of central to our devotional today how you are using both your natural talents and abilities and your spiritual gifts to bless the body of Christ. And that's part of what we are going to see was the problem with the broken church at Corinth. They were not dealing correctly with this aspect of spiritual gifts and spiritual giftedness. So as we begin chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes these words, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you used to be enticed and led away by mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know exactly what was going on there at Corinth, but apparently some people were saying God says this or God says that, and uh, th there were some things popping up that couldn't be true. Well, we'll talk about how that happens a little bit later. But in verse 4, he says, Now there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God produces each gift in each person. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit, by one Spirit. To another, the performing of miracles. I'm going to try to make my page turn here to get to the other side. There we go. The performing of miracles to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues, languages. One and the same spirit is active in all of these, distributing to each person as he wills. Now, here we are opening the can of worms about spiritual gifts, and we'll see in coming days how that's affecting the body of Christ, the church there at Corinth. But how do you look at these gifts, and what do we mean by spiritual gifts? Because it's, it's listed in many other places in the New Testament, and in different ways, and it's listed right here to the Corinthian church. Now, as one, as one particular commentator puts it, this charisma, that's the plural for gifts, means especially a gift of grace or a free gift. And in 16 of its 17 New Testament uses is connected to God as the giver. In Romans, for example, Paul uses it in reference to the gift of salvation, the blessings of God and the divine emblements, enablement excuse me, for ministry. Every other use of the word by Paul and the one by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4 relates to the divine enablements for believers to minister by the power of Jesus Christ. Now, spiritual gifts are not talents. Understand the difference, my friends. Natural talents, skills, and abilities are granted by God, just as everything good and worthwhile is a gift from Him. But those things are natural abilities shared by believers and unbelievers. You had plenty of talents before you came to Christ. Those are not the same as spiritual gifts. 
Now, an unbeliever can be, as he writes here, a highly skilled artist or musician, an atheist or an agnostic can be a great scientist, carpenter, athlete, or cook. If a Christian excels in any such abilities, it has nothing to do with his salvation. Though he may use his natural talents quite differently after he's saved, he possessed them before he became a Christian. But spiritual gifts come only as a result of your salvation. These are things bestowed upon you after you're born again. So, spiritual gifts, he writes, however, are not natural. They're rather supernaturally given by the Holy Spirit and always and only available to believers in Jesus Christ, without exception. Spiritual gifts are special capacities bestowed on believers to equip them to minister supernaturally to others, especially to each other. Consequently, if those gifts are not being used or being used rightly, the body of Christ cannot be the corporate manifestation of its head, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the work of God is hindered. So the use of spiritual gifts is something we need to be careful about in our churches to make sure these gifts are being used properly so that the body is unified, brought together, not divided, and is able to operate and function the way Jesus wants it to. That's the purpose of spiritual gifts. He goes on to say, essential to unity is diversity. Unity of spirit and purpose can be maintained only through diversity of ministry, but unity is not uniformity. A football team whose players all wanted to play quarterback would have uniformity, but not unity. It could not function as a team if everyone played the same position. That's Paul's point here. God gives his people varieties of gifts, just as players on a team have varieties of positions. Now, varieties basically means apportionments, allotments, or distributions with the derived idea of varieties. God distributes his gifts in many forms, in many varieties, to his children. He has a multiplicity of them, which are given to every believer. And they fall into two general types. There are speaking gifts and serving gifts. Now, the New Testament contains several lists of categories of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 is not the only one. You'll find in Romans chapter 12, 1 Peter 4, other places you'll find in Ephesians 4, some lists of giftedness given to the church. Now, Bible scholars do not agree on the exact number and distribution of those kinds of gifts. Because the scriptural lists are not identical, it seems clear that God did not intend to give his church either a rigid or precise and exhaustive compilation, but rather general categories. One should be careful not to overdefine the gifts because they resist overclassification. There's not much value, this writer says, in taking some of those tests, formal or informal, to determine what spiritual gifts we have. <laughs> I don't know. I've done that with a number of folks. And I think some of the neatest things about some personality and giftedness profiles is it helps you just clarify what God may be doing in and through you. So I, I disagree with the commentator here. I think sometimes there are uh, distinct values in going through those kind of profiles to help you determine how you can best serve the Lord and serve the church. Nothing wrong with that. But because a believer's gifts can be an overlapping combination, as he writes, it take, taking in different proportions and for each categories of the gifts, you know, one person may be obviously strong in a single gift, such as teaching. Another may not be strong in any one gift, but have some measure of three or four. It's best to see each person's gift, or I would say their giftedness, as a unique blend of the categories of gifts granted to that individual in connection with his or her traits and experiences and the needs of the church. Each believer becomes as uniquely spiritual as unique spiritually as his fingerprints are physically. Now that last statement is the one that I really like from this particular paragraph where he's saying that each believer when it comes to giftedness is unique. So the gifts that you have are not only designed just for you, but for your particular time and place in history, for your unique position within your community and church. God does not just distribute a certain 
rigid, defined gift to every single person and say, oh no, this is formula 43.45 and this is the only one I give out all over the world, you know, and if you get that particular gift, you this is what you get. You know, I think the giftedness that God has given us is unique to where we are at the time. If you're serving as a, a missionary today in Uganda, you might have a different set of gifts God is giving you than if you were the missionary in New York City. Now, why? Because he understands what the body needs in those places. And that's why the Holy Spirit is in, is in charge of this operation. You and I are not. You do not have the gifts you want to have. You have the gifts God wants you to have. They are bestowed, it says, by the Holy Spirit and for the benefit of the church as a whole. So when you are given those and you receive those, cherish them and use them. Be amazed that God, as, as I have noticed with people across the body of Christ, that God will amaze you that he's using you in certain ways that you never would have thought you could be used before. Not by your power, not by your natural talents that you had prior to your salvation, but because of the empowerment the Holy Spirit is giving to you right now for the here and now. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about this week. Are you gifted? If you've come to Christ and you know him by the power of his salvation in your life, you are gifted. The Holy Spirit has put some things in your life for the benefit of the body. Do you know what they are? Do you know what God's doing with you and why? I think it's important that every single believer recognize we do have a position on the team. We do have an assignment. And that's decided not by us, not because of our own whims. It's decided by the Holy Spirit who places us in the body for such a time as this. I'm going, to enjoy, I'm going to enjoy exploring these with you this week and discovering exactly what God's doing to equip his body for the greatest game of all as we're here in the last quarter before Jesus comes. Well, thanks for joining me this morning. We're going to do this again tomorrow. Wake up in the word with me. Ask a friend, like us, share us, and let's keep doing this. Let's keep looking up until he comes.